today it is the last lecture today and i appreciate uh, your time and uh, attention especially for those from europe and asia that are already late at night so i will talk about uh, uh, rule-based modeling with virtual cell and i remind you that we have uh, all the presentations are placed here on google drive so feel free to grab them we also record all the lectures and they will be at our youtube channel but not immediately so uh what about rule-based modeling uh today you saw either the list of reactions or a, a graphical visualization of a reaction network that look like that when you had species and species were connected through reaction nodes and then every such species corresponded to the variable and eventually you would solve the system of differential equations for all those variables or do them stochastic simulations and find the set of individual time courses so unfortunately this is a huge simplification that in reality the number of if you really talk about species and not variables describing the system then the number of species is huge we call them microscopic species those that may really exist in the model i mean not in the model but in the biological system and this is for example receptor tyrosine kinase egfr and you know that it has multiple binding sites and when in a pathway you model for example the binding of sarc to egfr then at the same time with sarc very often there is another adapter protein plc gamma and another able and bind to the receptor and they all form a huge complex maybe this complex is not huge but it may be large and the problem with uh, uh, modeling with traditional reaction networks is that you have ahead of time to limit the microscopic species that exist in your system to whatever you believe will exist in biological description because if you don't limit it if you try to model everything what you are interested for example you would like to predict time courses of each of these nine phosphocytes and you would like to predict formation of complexes with multiple adapter proteins you run up in a fact that is called combinatorial complexity when you have explosion in the number of possible molecular complexes or even phosphoforms of proteins and in pathways this problem is uh, kind of not very prominent because experimentally you identified key players and these key players would be variables in your model but there are situations when uh, uh, you don't know ahead of time what are individual players individual those that would be species or variables in your model like the most obvious is polymerization when you have for example actin filaments and they can form the range of uh, different lengths from several dozen to several hundreds of molecules or when you have for example antigen uh, receptor activation and then you have uh, multivalent ligands multivalent receptors and they form different uh, complexes on a cell membrane so this is a bivalent ligand trivalent receptor idealization and of course this is heavily dependent on the spatial effects on the shapes on the distances and tomorrow less low will be talking about how to model it properly with uh, uh, accounting for uh, diffusion of each of these sites and accounting for the steric clashes 
We will be talking today about how to model these complexes, considering them to be like beats, we are like uh, infinitely uh, flexible and uh, approachable. So this is, for example, a system when you have a, a receptor and then several SARC proteins. Oh, sorry, these are grab two proteins, SH2 is a three domain. And then you have, a, oh, no, I think this is, sorry, it's a NIC protein. And then you have an NWOS protein. So, and they are multi-site proteins that can form kind of different structures. Or even uh, easier system, when you have RNAs, and those RNAs, they again, they can form granules by going and binding to different proteins that will serve as a glue between different sites. So these are examples of biological systems where you really don't have a head of time understanding of what molecular complexes will be formed in your system. And if these molecular complexes can be like what species will be there. So how to model it? And uh, I will be telling you about modeling rule-based uh, based on the two tools that were developed uh, uh, independently. This is by Energen, Biological Network Generation, and NFSIM, Network Free Simulator. In both tools, and these are now part of the virtual cell, in both tools you have agents. You start with molecules. And there was a question earlier, what are molecules? So this is what's a molecule. It's a box that has several sites. Say, in this case, EGFR receptor would be a box consisting of EGF-like extracellular site, transmembrane domain, and two tyrosines, and each of them can be in unphosphorylated and phosphorylated form. So altogether, this molecule already represents four different species, where this side can be unphosphorylated, phosphorylated, and this side unphosphorylated, phosphorylated, and all the different combinations. And when you think about species that form uh, objects in a model, in a model then these species would consist of molecules. So this is a species, which is EGF, EGFR complex, and it is located in a membrane, and it has uh, two molecules being connected through the bond between EGF-like uh, site of EGF ligand and EGF-like site of EGF receptor. So these are agents, and then in a rule-based approach, you define what is important and what is not important for the interactions, which is called template or pattern. So this is a receptor pattern where you remember that receptor has a several sites and these sites would be in specific states. And in this case, we just define that site Y1092 is phosphorylated and we put question marks underneath. What does it mean? It means that this is a something that may exist as a part of multiple species. So now, exactly like that. So we have uh, this molecule, maybe part of a species consisting of the same molecule with this side being phosphorylated and another side unphosphorylated. It can be part of a more species that has both sides was related. It can be part of a ligand receptor complex. It can be part of a ligand receptor complex uh, in a different phosphor state. So you see, this is uh, uh, what we call observable. And again, in virtual cell, observable is uh, another part of physiology. And why it is observable? Because this is what we observe experimentally that we have a EGFR in a phospho 
state y turn 92. And we really, when we say about experimental observations, then we may not necessarily distinguish between wh where this EGFR is it in a monomeric form without ligand, is it in a form bound to a ligand, is it in a form completely phosphorylated, and so on. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, we have half an hour to go, and I believe that uh, we should have enough time for questions. Now, when we talk about how rules operate on these uh, molecular patterns, then uh, they bind or, mod or are modified with the way of declare being declared in a rule, but then everything what is not declared can take any values. So, for example, when ligand binds to receptor, we say that ligand must be unbound. It's shown by this side. Receptor must be unbound, shown by this side. Receptor must be in a monomeric form, shown by this TMG. And then the result of interaction is the formation of a bond between ligand and receptor. And these question marks here, and question marks underneath sites, mean that this is not a single interaction between ligand and specific monomeric receptor. But this is a class of interactions when ligand can bind completely unphosphorylated receptor, phosphorylated receptor phosphorylated on one side, receptor double phosphorylated, receptor phosphorylated on another side, or even binding of EGF to complexes where something sits here being bound to these two sites, indicated by these two question marks underneath those sites. So how the rule-based modeling works? You have a set of rules that is defined as you would describe it in a normal biological language, that EGF ligand would bind to EGF receptor monomeric form if EGF receptor is not bound to another ligand, and this binding is independent on the state of two intracellular tyrosines. And the result is binding of EGF to this site. And then say you have uh, two simplified rules of phosphorylation. For simplicity, we say that just single ligand triggers phosphorylation. So the rule tells you that EGF ligand or EGF receptor bound to a ligand shown by this underneath uh, line may be phosphorylated. So the site Y becomes site PY. And this phosphorylation is independent on whether something else is bound to this site or some or whether this site is phosphorylated, unphosphorylated or bound. And the same phosphorylation of this another site 1148. So these are three rules. And then we work in a regular agent-based paradigm when there, is, there are two initial agents that we call seed species. It's uh, EGF and EGF receptor. And the rules are applied to these uh, uh, two initial seed species. So we have a ligand receptor. They can bind according to the rule. Then once they bound, they can be phosphorylated on one of the two sites. And then once they are phosphorylated on one side, they also can be phosphorylated on another side. And they can break, and so on and so forth. So uh, for those who would like precise statement that we have a set of initial species, we have a set of the rules, and then rules are applied to the set of species to form the set of reactions, the set of new species. Then again, the set of rules is applied to this larger set of species to form the new set of reactions, new set of species, and so on and so forth. And at some point, you may end up with a situation when you exhaust everything, when you just generate all the species that exist in this world for this specific closed biological system. 
then you terminate. Or you may never come to this case if, for example, you have a uh, polymerization. Then you terminate when you exhaust all the molecules in your uh, system. So what I described to you is a way of uh, biological network generator working. When you have a seed species rules, you generate a reaction network, and then you can compute this reaction network in the way done with uh, uh, virtual cell occupancy. And by the way, tomorrow we'll talk about how to interact between virtual cell and occupancy. So while you will be studying today and working on your projects, please keep in mind that you start with one tool, you made a model, you feel that you need something else, you can switch the model to another tool. So uh, if your system is uh, potentially infinite, then you can go with what is called network-free simulation. Network-free really means that you don't generate a network. So you start with this set of rules and you just stochastically generate molecular complexes that may exist in a system based on propensities, reaction rates of reactions. So let me quickly show you how it works in uh, uh, the tool. So, uh, we start with uh, the three molecules. One is uh, just abstract system. Molecule A with three sides. Sorry. Molecule B and these three sites, uh, one of them will be bind, will be potentially binding to molecule B, two will be binding to molecule B, and one will be binding to molecule C. Then you have a molecule B with three sites for molecule A and one side for molecule C, and molecule C with two sites for B and three sites for A. So it's actually nephron nick and wasp system, but I will not overload you with uh, uh, terminology. So you really don't, so let's first try to uh, simulate those system deterministically. So wh what are interactions between those, these molecules? So this is uh, Zoom doesn't like virtual cell or it doesn't like my computer. Uh, so this is a binding of A to B, which is you have a three sides on A, you have a three, three side for, on B, and they form a complex. And this complex is, a, this binding is independent on the B and C. B and C can be bound at the same time to something else. So it may be also such kind of interaction when A and B are already in a complex, they are connected somehow, so they're in a large molecular complex, but then they still have a two sides available for each other. So B side on A and A side on B. And they form, they're already in a complex, so they form an extra bonding between B and A, and so on and so forth. So you have the same, uh, rule for binding of A to C when free side on A can bind free side on C, we can form uh, internal bond when A and C are already in a complex and they can form a bond if they have free sides within this complex. So if we try to simulate this system deterministically, then we can do it up to some step. So let's go and do it just for three steps, which means that we have a initial mo three molecules with certain counts and we just actually let's go even two. So just to show you how complex the system becomes, 
even after two interactions. After two interactions, it will be, so guess, will it be more or less than 100 species? There will be 417 species. And let me show you what, uh, this is just three steps. Like you start with uh, two, three molecules and they combine in all the different ways. Uh, and actually virtual cell uh, deterministically doesn't like these uh, uh, large systems because it's 417 species and 492 interactions between them. It's actually my computer doesn't like zoom together with uh, uh, these large systems. Yeah, okay. So only two interactions, only two steps, which means that you, I think that you don't go over uh, complexes at four molecules at most, but there are 417 different molecular configurations and you need to keep track of all of them, if you would like to model like synaptic densities, uh, uh, receptor clustering, all these kind of effects, uh, filaments formation. So if you want to model the complete system, how it will go, you do it with NFC network free simulation. So you have the same set of molecules and let's see in this system we have uh, 300 molecules of a 200 molecules b and 100 molecules c and you have the same propensities so the interaction rates between uh, molecules is the same and I believe that it's uh, uh, 100 micro yeah 100 per second per micromolar and then reverse rate is 0.1 per second so let's see how this system uh, can be simulated and I've seen high count and I already simulated it uh, so so uh, this is if we simulated for one second and out of 600 different molecules, we form 20 different clusters. And these 20 different clusters, they are shown here. You can see that some of them are pretty small. They are just two or six different molecules, some of them would be huge. And we can load this data on a computer and analyze it. But you can see the structure of this large complex. And what's interesting, okay, so, uh, you do so you this is if you run it for one second if you run it for 50 seconds then what would happen with uh, this uh, molecular complex and then you have a 
Actually, no, nothing really happens. So you basically means that you reached almost so the same two, four, six molecules, and you can check that. Okay, so but if you increased the rate of uh, uh, binding between different sites, then you should be able to see, I believe, the smaller number of uh, clusters, which would be larger. And this is stochastic, so, oh. Yeah, so when when I did it previous time, it actually gave me for increased KF a smaller number of clusters. But maybe we reached a, a so we actually can check what's going on with the uh, like working with these large complexes is really tricky because uh, uh, like just looking into them is complicated and what we can do we can check these observables so again there was a question before what are observables so uh this is for example observable called perfect machine which means that it's a complex that has all molecules being bound to each other so you see we show that all these lines so this is a fully connected cluster. And another observable would be uh, number like clusters that have uh, more than three molecules A in it. And another observable would be cluster that has uh, uh, more than a mole more than 10 molecules A in it. So we can do analysis on such a, uh, stimulations and see, for example, that, okay, so we have a, uh, if we, so it's probably easier to uh, compare this simulation with uh, uh, increased on rate with a simulation uh, with a standard on rate. And this is what virtual cell is convenient for, that you can, uh, so first of all, you see how many different simulations I have. Each of them is different from each other by some of the, so it can be different times. It can be also different rates and, or any, any numerical parameters. So here I increased uh, uh, tenfold, uh, 100 fold, uh, two, sorry, two fold, uh, uh kf and you can do it like you click on this uh, edit button and you show what will be the old default parameters that are defined in physiology and new parameters that you define here so let's see what will happen if you have a standard uh, on rate if you have an on rate which is twofold larger and if you have a decreased on rate and these simulations you basically uh like it's pretty unique you cannot do it with uh, uh any at least it would be difficult to do it with any other tool and uh, uh, get uh, uh, results and get easy adjustable uh, simulations so let's see uh, okay, so this is increased, this is a standard. And we would compare, uh, say greater than three. Okay, so, uh, and this is the same, yeah. So with increased uh, KF, we have a, a number of uh, complexes that have uh, uh, more than three 
а, molecule A pretty steady, and here we got that it peaks, and then it goes down. So why? Because we just have a smaller number of complexes of like small complexes and larger number of larger complex. So you see here we have a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here we have a larger number of larger complexes. So which means that despite we have the same number of uh, complexes, we still have uh, subtle differences when we increase the number of uh, uh, the on rate. So this kind of analysis is uh, done in uh, NFCM and also it can be done in spring salad that less low will be talking tomorrow. So uh, if someone is uh, really not very interested in analysis of specific clusters, then rule-based modeling can be used also for uh, analysis for modeling of uh, uh, standard pathways. And again, the molecules that are defined here are very useful for uh, bringing the information into your models. So Anne already mentioned about the way of adding uh, annotations, but even annotations are uh, kind of maybe not enough to show you what's going on in a system. Bringing molecules will immediately make your model transparent. So let's go into uh, the model that Anne was demonstrating. And for that, like da having database in a virtual cell is uh, really amazing. You can uh, go and So uh, go into tutor tutorial multi-app and sometimes virtual cell jumps behind. So uh, this is a model when you have run C, run C, uh, and this is kind of maybe really tricky to follow in a large system. So you introduce molecule, run, you introduce molecule, C. And then when you go into species, and then now your species run would be really consistent of a molecule run. Your species C would be consistent of a molecule C. And then your run C is now the complex of a run and of a C. So this is a simple way, and then the same here. The simple way to make a, a kind of what we call rule-based CFI uh, regular model. And then when you go back to reaction diagram, you now can see the composition of all the different molecules. And then you can make it already the real rule-based molecule, uh, rule-based model. And how you do it, for example, if you have a run, oh, sorry, cargo. So now your cargo, you should be able, you would like to track whether it's uh, going through the nuclear membrane in phosphorylated or unphosphorylated form. So you go, this is Y1. And then this state, it has the two states. You 
p and now your system i mean you you need to now figure out what exactly going through the membrane but now your system becomes uh, uh the the real rule based when you can move from the membrane not just a single cargo molecule but potentially two different cargo two for two states of cargo molecule but then again ask me if you're interested now we have to fix the system so uh if, if it's not rule-based model but a regular system then you have to go and in a species uh, you have to specify so this is not real species because it's a, i mean it's a combination of two different species so it's either unphosphorylated or phosphorylated so let's say that we have it phosphorylated unphosphorylated unphosphorylated so now you bring it back to the normal executable model but now you really track not only composition of species but you also track what are the internal states and then if you really would like to do it a proper rule-based model then there is a rule-based run transport tutorial that tells you that you have uh, how to move from one compartment to another compartment as a set of uh, multiple molecules so in this case you have reactions that you have a cargo that has a three different phosphocytes and the cargo can bind uh, I mean it can be a phosphorylated in cytosol so there is a way to phosphorylate on one side phosphorylate on another side phosphorylate on the third side and then your transport across the membrane is now you transport not just a single for no, not just a single species but you transport multiple fossil forms of cargo and again as we pointed out the same model can be simulated in multiple ways what was demonstrated by n was non-spatial deterministic you can do non-spatial stochastic pd stochastic spatial and now we can also do nfc so the same model can be simulated in multiple ways the model still defined with a uh, set of rules uh, but it to use ODE or SSA or PD, this model defined with a set of rules still has to be finite. Like you cannot work with a potentially infinite system like an NFC case. So just to give you an idea, the model that has a three sides on cargo. Let's see how many different chemical species are there. So 11, 20, 30, 35. So I guess that it will end, yeah, 36. So there are 36 species in a system where you move across nuclear membrane, not just a single cargo, but cargo in various possible forms uh okay so i think that uh, i covered all uh, features of role-based modeling that are important to point out and i don't want to take time out of uh, our training session so any questions